The following program is the work of the broadcast students at the British Columbia Institute of Technology. BCIT Magazine features news stories from around the Lower Mainland which were produced over the last week. Responsibility for the content of the show rests completely with the students and their instructors. Today on BCIT Magazine, the new Compass Card causes more problems for TransLink and for persons with disabilities. Plus, thousands attend the memorial service for North Shore Rescue Service leader Tim Jones. And one man celebrates the life of a family member during the Variety Club weekend. Hello and welcome to BCIT Magazine. I'm Kyle Hawking. And I'm Blanca Blandin. Thousands turned out to pay their final respects to North Shore Rescue Leader Tim Jones this past weekend. Jones died while hiking Mount Seymour on January 19th. Throughout his career, Jones led more than 1,600 search and rescue missions. My co-anchor Kyle Hawking was at the memorial and has a story. It was a day drenched in brilliant sunshine as family, friends, co-workers and well-wishers said goodbye to Tim Jones, the man who led the North Shore Rescue Service for more than two decades. A parade of police, fire, ambulance, military and North Shore Rescue volunteers began the day, marching from the Armory to Centennial Theatre in North Vancouver. Members of the public were invited to watch the service from big screens set up in the parking lot next door to the theater. Tim's ashes were delivered by North Shore Rescue, and then the chaplain began. Tim was a loving and dedicated husband, father, and son, and brother. We are blessed to have had him in our lives. He will be sorely missed, but his legacy will live on. Jones was eulogized by his lifelong friend, Ross Halloway, who shared memories and anecdotes. My first recollection of that red-haired, freckle-faced little boy was of him in a rock fight with one of the neighborhood kids. But Tim ducked and I got nailed. <laughs> and then the final send-off, a rolling salute, and Jones's ashes were delivered to the helicopter, which would carry them away to be spread on the North Shore Mountains. And those mountains on which Jones had undertaken so many search and rescue missions served as the backdrop for his memorial. Kyle Hawking in North Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. The 2014 Show of Hearts Telethon took place last weekend. For one family, it's a time to look back and celebrate the life of their daughter, who lost her life to leukemia seven years ago. Avtar Baines is the owner of Ricky's Restaurant in Surrey. In memory of his daughter, Baines donates a portion of his food sales to the annual Variety Club fundraiser. Renil Desai has the story. For the past eight years, Ricky's All Day Grill has held a weekend-long fundraiser for Variety, the children's charity. Owner Avtar Baines got the idea after receiving some advice from his late daughter. About 10, 12 minutes? Yeah. Well, you know, when my, uh, my daughter and I, um, we were watching TV one day. Uh, I think she was about four years old at the time. And, um, and actually, no, I'm sorry, she was two at the time. And we were watching Variety. And she just said, you know, she said, Daddy, we should help them. Right? And I've never forgotten that. Throughout the day, volunteers spent time preparing food and selling raffle tickets for door prizes. Over the years, Baines has raised well over $70,000. I think it's very important that, you know, that we show to the families with Ill, Ill children that, you know what, they're not alone. You know, we are together in this battle. And yes, you know what, life has, has, you know, thrown this obstacle at them, right? But at the end of the day, their child will get better and we want to make this life as pleasurable for them as possible. For the kids, how many arms lengths would you like? Every one of the volunteers has various reasons as to why they help out at Ricky's All Day Grill. But one quality that they all share in common 
is their passion to help make a difference. Because we have had a loss in this family and uh, that's why it's uh, close to the heart. You know, like to raise 10, 11, $12,000 for, for the kids and variety. That's, that makes a difference, all of us together. I had lots of best friends with cancer. My brother had been a diagnosed with immune deficiency at a young age. Um, and she had a young I have a cousin, cousin who also was diagnosed, so yeah. we want to help support. Justine for three. Helping others will always be a priority for Baines and his family, and as the years pass, they pledge to continue to act from their hearts in support of children with special needs. Renelle Desai in Surrey for BCIT Magazine. Hepatitis B is an incurable but treatable disease. And here in BC, it's a growing problem amongst newcomers. In response, the government has launched an education campaign. Blaine Sayers has more. The Asian community is coming together to educate new immigrants about the dangers of hepatitis B. Jason Chan is a lifelong patient of hepatitis B. Actually, I think I, I conjured when I was really young. I only knew it when I was 16. But BC Health Minister Terry Lake says that's not always the case. Many of those who are infected with chronic hepatitis may not know they are in fact infected because the symptoms are not apparent until the liver is severely affected. The Let's Talk About B education program encourages dialogue to encourage those in high-risk communities to get uh, tested. UBC Dr. Eric Yoshida, who specializes in liver disease, believes education can save lives. This education program is going to go a long ways to helping. Um, I think we need this. Death from liver failure and death from cancer, I can tell you right now. And the need for liver transplant, it happened last month. It's going to happen next month. It's going to happen next year unless we do something about it. Jason agrees with the new program and is offering advice to new immigrants. Nothing to be afraid of. The thing is, if you don't deal with it, it will creep into your life gradually. The numbers are staggering for Vancouver's Asian communities and the time for testing is now. Many of those born in Asia may have contracted hepatitis B at birth and are not aware that they are infected. It's estimated that one in 17 newcomers to our province are infected with chronic hepatitis B. It's something treatable and it's something in the long run I, I can say you, you, can, you can still maintain a very good quality of life if you treat it properly. Thanks to Health BC, many new residents will hopefully follow Jason's advice. Blaine Sayers in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. Coming up next on BCIT Magazine, BC farmers and restaurants team up in a campaign to get people eating and buying local. Plus, the Vancouver Whitecaps open their 2014 preseason this week with many new faces on the soccer pitch. I chose BCIT because I know that all the programs are very hands-on. We have our own radio station, like it's, it's one of the best programs that I've ever heard of. I am starting a job on Monday, so confidence is high. I, honestly, I didn't think it was going to be this fun. A defining moment for me was when I finished my first internship and got lots of really great feedback from industry professionals. I would never imagine I'd be walking into the floors of TSN and thinking, I'm not a student anymore, I'm here to work. I will be starting a job with an investigative news program in Toronto and I'm really excited to see that grow into what will become hopefully my dream job. BCIT broadcasts and online journalism, putting you to work. Welcome back. TransLink's new compass card system is creating difficulty for people with disabilities. According to the company, part of the problem is that some of the drivers still need to be trained on the new system. Blanca Blandin has this report. By the end of the month, 80,000 transit users will be tapping on and off with their compass cards. The card seems simple enough to use, but for Jim, who has a disability, a lack of clear instruction has made the process challenging. It's difficult to use. 
Jim rides a bus every day and has been told by some bus drivers to tap out at the rear of the bus. Maneuvering to the back of the bus can create stress for people with disabilities. A lot of times you go to the back door and you can't even get through. Uh, and it just causes anxiety for the guys and stuff like that. Uh, I just definitely think there needs to be, from people that I've talked to in the field, with people that they support, there needs to be more clarification. I think there's quite a few people with disabilities out there that are having, still having problems. According to TransLink, customers have the option to tap on and off at either end. However, bus drivers unfamiliar with how the compass card works may be the reason behind the confusion. We're partway through the training for the, for the bus drivers, about half to two-thirds of the way through, so not all of our bus drivers have had the, have had the training. TransLink expects bus drivers to be fully trained by the beginning of the summer. Blanca Blandin in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. Bell's annual Let's Talk Day raised over $5 million for mental health initiatives. The company donated five cents for every tweet, text and Facebook share with the hashtag Let's Talk. Over 100 million posts were made during the day-long event. BC farmers and restaurants are trying to get people to purchase locally grown foods. The Buy Local, Eat Natural campaign has released a new app that allows users to find growers and restaurants offering local produce. Our reporter Sarah Sanga has the story. Every evening, Tap Restaurant in South Surrey serves its diners with a variety of different savory menu options. The restaurant features fresh local vegetables and sous chef Hannah says it's a great way to support the community. I think it is important to um, support your community wherever you are. I mean, it's not like um, you don't want to go and source something from the East Coast if you don't have to. If you can support somebody in your area, then why not do that? TAP is part of the nonprofit Buy Local, Eat Natural, which just released an app encouraging people to eat seasonal, locally grown foods, bringing together farmers, restaurants, and the Dairy Association. Project leaders say it's a great way to boost the local economy. You're supporting local farmers, but also you're eating fresher food, food that hasn't traveled as far. Uh, well, what we wanted out of the app is to have a central place for um, for people in BC to find local food, also to find the seasonality of their food and to discover what is available all year round in BC. For Chef Hannah, it's also a way to get creative. Yeah, I mean, whatever they have available, we try and use on our menu. So our dinner vegetables always change. Whatever they have available, whatever we can get from uh, Natty at Hazelmere Farm, she'll just say, you know what, I have a huge bag of Brussels sprouts that I can bring you guys for a great price. Done, they're on our menu that night, so. For more info on the campaign and to download the app, go to buylocaleatnatural.com. Sarah Sanga in South Surrey for BCIT Magazine. For a number of years now, Vancouver Police and Burnaby RCMP have partnered together to offer self-defense classes at SFU. After a series of attacks at UBC, they are now focusing on teaching women how to protect themselves. Our reporter Steve Kioka took a class to learn some of their self-defense tactics. While most people are unwinding on a Friday night, these martial arts students are just getting warmed up. Police Judo is a program where local officers use judo tactics along with police procedures to teach the art of self-defense. Um, I really like it because it makes me feel safer on my own, especially as a student up at SFU, um, transiting to and from, busing to and from. I live in Maple Ridge, so it's pretty far out. And just like knowing the security around campus too, because a lot of the security guards are here. Instructors say the SFU-based program can be helpful to women in light of the recent UBC attacks. We would like to host some self-defense clinics uh, for female students up at the university campus here uh, uh, to help them get some confidence and develop some skills if they are involved in a physical altercation. So we're proposing that we will uh, run a few of these clinics and uh, it will be as a community service by Police Tudo. And they teach you a lot of good techniques here where, where I think it will bring up the confidence of women and I think women will feel a lot safer as well, they're fitter, they, they have been in that situation where, where you know, a bigger guy is coming out at them over here and now if they got a guy about that size they, they won't feel intimidated, at least they have, dealt, they have felt the strength of that guy before, the weight as well and I think it's, it's a huge plus for them. I feel a lot more comfortable than I used to walking home, especially um, as a student here, I'm an engineering student, 
So I have a lot of late nights up in the lab, and then walking back like to the bus stop or to my car, I feel a lot safer knowing that I can take care of myself. Police Judo runs Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Friday nights at the SFU campus. Steve Kioka in Burnaby for BCIT Magazine. The Vancouver Whitecaps have kicked off their 2014 season. It was a busy off-season for the team. They promoted Carl Robinson to head coach and lost leading scorer Camilo after he bolted to Mexico. But this week, it was all about introducing the new players to Vancouver. Blaine Sayers reports. Beneath all this fog and haze lies the 2014 Vancouver Whitecaps preseason squad. Through the dense shroud, it's easy to pick out the veterans of this Whitecaps team. While you won't find star striker Camilo under this heavy fog, you will see many new players ready to make the big club. Whitecaps 2014 first round super draft pick Christian Dean is one of those players looking to impress the coaches and he's excited for the opportunity. First professional experience uh, with the team besides you know the uh, physicals and everything and putting the jersey on is probably one of the most exciting things I've ever done. Team captain Jay Demerit is thrilled about the team's youth movement and is welcoming any new challenges. It's exciting to see uh, not only what we can get out of those guys, but uh, you know, as the leaders of this group, how, how far we can push them to be a part of this group. And I think uh, that's going to be the biggest challenge for us uh, as, as the older leaders of this team. As a center back, Dean will spend a lot of time with fellow American Demerit, and he's eager to learn from the veteran defender. Jay is you know, one of the best center backs ever you know, that played in you know, the United States, so hopefully learn from them. There were many new faces on field today for the Vancouver Whitecaps' first on-field training session of 2014, but Christian Dean still managed to stand out, making a huge impression on new coach Carl Robinson. He's massive. He is huge. <laughs> When I'm talking to him, I'm looking up. Um, I think he's, put, you know, he made one or two tackles today with, with some of the smaller guys. You know, I watched their face, and it, it was very interesting. Um, so he's got a big future ahead of him, and I look forward to seeing how he develops over the preseason period. While the 2014 Whitecaps' success remains a foggy mystery, the team hopes new additions like Dean can lift any preseason gloom before their home opener on March 8th. Blaine Sayers in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. Well, folks, with the Winter Olympics in Sochi right around the corner, there are still some lingering questions about Canada's athletes. One of the most notable questions, of course, is that of Steven Stamkos, member of the Olympic hockey team who suffered a broken leg in November. He hopes, however, to be back in time for the Games, and our reporter, Renil Desai, joins us now to discuss the probability of Stamkos returning in time. Renil, where is Stamkos with his rehabilitation? Well, Kyle, Canada's first match is against Norway on February the 13th. Back in November 11th, that's where Stamkos broke his right tibia. And the next day, Steve Eisman said the absolute best case was about a three-month recovery. Stamkos seems to be on the right track and has his eyes firmly set on the Olympic Games. He has been cleared for light contact and has participated in a few on-ice drills. After receiving positive feedback from his latest x-rays, he'll continue to ramp up the on and off ice workouts. His goal is to play in one of Tampa's final six games before the Olympic break. Their last game is on February the 8th, which will give Eisman a few days to fully assess Stamkos. If he does not get a regular season game in, he still plans to travel with the team. And despite his absence, Stamkos still leads all NHLers in goals since the 2010 Winter Olympic Games with 164. So if all goes well, Canada's chances to defend the gold is much higher if Stamkos is in the lineup. And another question mark is Mayel Ricker, who won gold for Canada in snowboard cross at the 2010 Winter Games. Renel, she suffered an injury recently. What's her status? Well, the road to defending her snowboard cross title just got a whole lot tougher. Ricker, who was expected to medal in Sochi, has been sidelined with a wrist injury that she suffered during one of her training sessions in Aspen. Now, the extent of the injury is unknown at this point, but we do know she'll have to have surgery. Ricker is optimistic she'll join Team Canada with the goal of competing in the snowboard cross event on February the 16th. If healthy, this would be Ricker's fourth Olympic appearance. But if the North Vancouver native cannot compete, Carly Brenneman of Whistler, B.C. would be her replacement.
Coming up next on BCIT Magazine, from Commercial Drive to the Caribbean, a local woman collects donations and supplies for an organization in Jamaica that takes in children with special needs. And a new public school lunch program in North Vancouver emphasizes healthy eating habits and waste reduction. The most rewarding thing for me has been the relationships I developed in the program, both with instructors and classmates. My sense of confidence has never, never been higher. I mean, this, this program has offered great opportunities to be in real world, real industry situations, and, and being in those moments and knowing I can contribute, I can do this. It's exciting to be in this industry and to meet lots of great people and to make amazing friends. BCIT broadcast and online journalism, realizing your potential. Standby graphics, ready camera one. If you want to experience the fast-paced world of news, today on BCIT Magazine, striking. Make magic on a movie set, frame. And action. Or bring your creative ideas to life. BCIT's hands-on training will get you started. BCIT Television and Video Production. Your possibilities start here. On February 10th, the city of Coquitlam is hosting its annual Fit and Frolic Walk. Everybody's welcome to join the walk or run, and there'll be fun activities for the kids. Dress up in red and pink to support Heart Month. Now speaking of hearts, the Vancouver Symphony Orchestra is performing a series of selections on Valentine's Day. Come see songs from Romeo and Juliet and West Side Story on the most romantic day of the year to get you in the mood. Now if you're looking for data ideas, the Vancouver Fringe Festival will be performing their rendition of the Puck and Pickle Pub. Come see Fringe actors portray such hockey commentators as Jim Houston and Kelly Rudy. And that's your BCIT Community Calendar, I'm Steve Kioka. A Vancouver woman is collecting donations for a Jamaican organization that's helping children with special needs. Our reporter Shannon Brennan brings us a story. Local yoga teacher Danielle Hugenboom is getting ready for her annual trip to Jamaica. She went there for a yoga retreat three years ago and has been bringing donated goods ever since. She says meeting the founder of an organization that helps women and children in need changed her life. So Sister Jackie is an ordinary woman in Jamaica that I met a couple of years ago and she started a youth home. So she started taking in children with learning disabilities, wheelchair-bound children, children with HIV. Hugenboom is collecting coloring books, iPads, and medical supplies to bring. Every year she has more donated goods, and this time she has the support of local businesses like Lunapad, a company that manufactures eco-friendly menstrual pads for women. They've donated close to 100 units so far, and co-founder Madeline Shaw says what Danielle is doing is inspiring. Look at the benefit that it's having, like she's changing and providing material benefit to an entire community that would otherwise be severely marginalized and just through her efforts she has recruited people to support her and businesses to support her. Jamaica doesn't have the same social services that we have in place here and Sister Jackie's House of Love caters to children and women who need the help most. Sister Jackie is probably one of the most inspiring women that I've ever met. She, when you ask her why she does this, she says, if I didn't, who would? And I think that's um, something that we can really use in this world. If we can all do something small, we really can make a difference. Danielle leaves for Jamaica in two weeks and hopes to bring five suitcases of donated art materials, medical supplies, and used iPads. They will be collecting donations through Sister Jackie's House of Love page on Facebook. Shannon Brennan in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. February marks Black History Month. To kick off the celebration, Vancouver's Mayor Gregor Robertson will make a presentation honoring the life and work of tap dancing legend Jenny Lagon. He will also unveil a new Canada Post stamp featuring the iconic Joe Forte, Vancouver's first lifeguard. Eating healthy is a top priority for many, but when it comes to elementary school children, it may be tougher to implement healthy eating habits. That's why local company Foodie Kids launched a business that offers lunch programs focusing on healthy eating and reducing waste. It's a win-win situation that has many schools starting to get on board. Renil Desai has the story. 
It's another day in the kitchen where chefs prepare and pack lunch for students at West Bay Elementary. Coordinator Michelle Tang says parents and teachers love the combination of nutrition and waste reduction. We love that we compost any leftovers and we use reusable containers. And for items that, that can't have the reusable containers, we use recyclable containers. So it's, they're happy with, I guess, the type of food that we're offering, which is healthy and um, just good for the environment. <laughs> Once all the cooking is wrapped up, it will be time to sort through the lunch packs. It's the quality and service that West Bay Elementary appreciates. All their reusable containers, they take the, back the food garbage and then they sort through everything themselves, which, you know, is very different again. They arrive in school with all the food uh, items labeled, sorted, and already in the boxes and bags. I don't have to make lunch. As a parent, I don't have to make lunch. It's great. I can just get up, serve them breakfast, and then they're off to school. I don't have to worry. I think we introduce food items that most kids probably would not think to try, and some of the parents are, um, they like the idea that they can introduce new foods through school. Tang and the rest of her crew load up the car and hit the road to deliver their lunches. The lunch program currently works with 17 schools around the Lower Mainland. Renelle Desai in North Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. If you have any questions or comments regarding this program, please visit us online at bcit-broadcast.com or bcitbroadcastnews.ca. I'm Blanca Blandin. And I'm Kyle Hawking, and that's today's BCIT Magazine. Thanks for watching. We leave you now with more from the Tim Jones Memorial in North Vancouver.